My name is Robin Walker. I'm also known as the Black History Man. Uh, what I do for a living is I do four things. I'm an author, a publisher, an investor, and a general dog's body, also known as education officer at uh, Croydon Supplementary Education Project. The book is called Everyday Life in an Early West African Empire, and it's available from the website www.everydaylifeinanearlywestafricanempire.com and that book is the history of a medieval West African empire called the Empire of Songhai and me and two colleagues wrote the book uh, a friend of ours, uh, Jacinth Martin, published the book and it's published through her company Siven Events Management and we were able to get Dr. Renoka Rashidi to write the afterword. So that's the book, Everyday Life in an Early West African Empire. It is a fact that when people think of Africa, um, African history doesn't conjure up very much for most people because black people have largely been erased from the respectable commentary of history. So why is that? Well, the modern world of today didn't start today, it started in 1492. And what happened in 1492? Europe became the most powerful people on the planet. The fact that Europe has conquered, colonized and enslaved the rest of the world means that Europe controls information about the rest of the world. And they've been able to control the information in two ways. They control it directly by controlling information and they control discourse around the information. Now, once people are in a position to control information, they are able to decide what goes into the schools, what goes into colleges, what goes into universities. They are able to decide whether or not a particular book gets stocked in a bookshop. They are able to decide what TV documentaries get made about certain information. And essentially, Europe has had something of a monopoly. And they've been able to use that monopoly to present themselves as the centerpiece of world history, world culture, world civilization, and remove us and the Native Americans completely from world history. And once you control what goes into the bookshops, what, once you control what goes into the schools, the colleges, the universities, once you control what gets into the media, you're, it's possible to reinforce a position that removes black people from world history. And that's what Europe has done. A second element as well is that Europe has controlled the discourse around history. And what that discourse in fact means is on one hand, Europe has done a great deal to conquer, colonize and enslave black people and destroy our written records. Europe has also been able to uh, write their versions of our history, sometimes quite truthful, sometimes quite accurate versions. The third thing they've been able to do has been to discredit those European scholars that told the truth. Now, that's a very powerful position because then you have one group of people telling the truth and another group discrediting them. So when ancient Greeks tell us that the ancient Egyptians were black people, you can then discredit those ancient Greek writers. When we're dealing with the West African Empire of Songhai and Lady Lugard writes her book, A Tropical Dependency, which tells about the West African Empire of Songhai, you can discredit her and make her book disappear. And these are the kind of tricks they've been able to do. And then the fourth and final thing that Europeans have been able to do is shift the discourse by moving the goalposts. At one time, history was about, do you have records? And of course, when we're dealing with the West African Empire of Songhai, there's some good, solid material written by black scholars in the 17th and 16th centuries about that empire, which you could use as good source material. Then, in the age of what we now call postmodernism, you can then say, we don't believe any sources. 
and every source has to be checked, has to be scrutinized from a skeptical perspective, the perspective that says, I don't believe this. Now, Europe can play that game because Europe has got so many records, you can diss half of them and then run with the other half and the history doesn't change. But if you have fewer records to begin with, because so many of them have been destroyed, once you present what you have, you can't then diss half because what's left you can't write a history from. And that's a way of moving the goalposts so that even when we do have records, scholars are able to downplay and disregard the history. Why has the history of African peoples been erased? Well, we don't live in a fair world. Things aren't fair. You don't get equal opportunities. You get the opportunities that you create for yourself. And if someone gets in there first and they conquer you, they colonize you, they enslave you, they simply make your history disappear to make it look like they conquered, colonized and enslaved nobodies. When people have a history, that makes you a somebody. So if you remove the history, you become a nobody. And so your history disappearing, nobody's lamenting the loss of that history. That's why conquerors, colonizers and enslavers make the people whose history they've conquered, colonized and enslaved disappear. There are psychological reasons why people would want to associate themselves with a history. There is a link between what someone thinks of themselves, what someone thinks of their people and their history. Now, scholars talk about personal esteem. That means self-esteem. And then you have interpersonal or group esteem, which is what you think of your group or what you think of your race, racial esteem. Self-esteem and racial esteem are not the same thing. Someone can have very high self-esteem where they think highly of themselves and very low racial esteem where they think very badly of other black people. And in truth, most black people have very high self-esteem and very low racial esteem. And that's one of the reasons why black people are prone to fight each other, prone to disagree with each other, prone to conflict with each other, because someone thinks very highly of themselves and someone thinks very lowly of their group. And what happens is, if people can call each other the N and the B word, they're really saying, I don't give a monkeys about the black race. They've really just said that their racial esteem is very, very low. But every black person usually has very high personal esteem. So if someone thinks highly of themselves and very lowly of their group, that is a recipe for fighting. That is a recipe for conflict. And the way to raise people's racial esteem is to introduce them to their history. Um, and if the history happens to be a great history, a history that people objectively can be proud of, they will see their people in a very different way to how they see their people at present. And that's the difference between high self-esteem, low racial esteem, to having a balance where you have high self-esteem and high racial or ethnic esteem. The purpose of my work generally is to build that psychological balance between high personal esteem and high self-esteem. Looking at the Songhai Empire, there are four main chronicles of that empire. There was an African professor from Timbuktu called Mahmoud Kati, and he was writing in the 16th century. He wrote a text called Tariq El Fetash, which means Chronicle for the Seeker of Truth. And that book has since been translated into English. It was translated and published in 2011. And I have it. It was edited by Professor Christopher Wise. And it gives a very detailed account of the Songhai Empire of West Africa and two previous West African empires, the Empire of Mali and the Empire of Ghana. There's another source by another Timbuktu professor called Abdarrahman 
El Sadi. His book is called Tariq El Sudan, which means History of the Land of the Blacks. And that was translated into English by a scholar in this country, uh, Professor Hunwick, Joseph Hunwick. And that gives us two indigenous sources of the Empire of Songhai and its two predecessor empires, Mali and Ghana. Then there was a visitor to the Songhai Empire in the 16th century. His name was Leo Africanus, and he was a person from Morocco. He visited the empire and wrote a compilation book called The History and Geography of Africa. And a lot of that book was published somewhere around 1526. Then there was an Englishman called Richard Jobson, who visits the Gambia region in around 1620 and wrote a book on it called The Golden Trade. So what we have then is four really good sources that enable us to reconstruct the history of the Songhai Empire. And these sources, when you put them together, tell us that the Songhai Empire was the rise and fall of 61 kings. These kings began to rule in West Africa from the year 690 AD and they continued to rule right up until 1595. These 61 kings ruled as part of three dynasties, the Zua dynasty, the Sunni dynasty, and the Askia dynasty. Of these 61 kings, we have good detailed information on one third of them, approximately 20. And that enables us to tell a very detailed history and it enables us to fill in other gaps that will essentially detail the rise and fall of the Songhai Empire, telling a story every bit as grand as when Europeans talk about the Roman Empire. Now, what happened was, um, in 1896, a Frenchman visited West Africa called Major Félix Dubois. He wrote a book called Timbuktu the Mysterious, where he came across one of these chronicles, the Tariq el Sudan, and turned it into a history book and into a travelogue. And that's the first great modern account of the Songhai Empire. And he's describing, among other things, a university culture that used to exist in 16th century Africa. Places like Timbuktu was a place of learning and scholarship. After him, English woman Lady Lugard wrote a tropical dependency, which wasn't just about the Songhai Empire. She talked about ancient Ghana, medieval Mali, the Hausa city-states of northern Nigeria, the Bornu Empire, and African civilizations in Morocco and Spain. At one time, black people used to rule in Spain. There were a series of dynasties that scholars call the Moorish period in Spain. Lady Lugard has that information. The next development was a Muslim sheikh from West Africa, uh, Professor Sheikh Anta Diop. Um, Diop is the pronunciation we use in English, but apparently Senegalese people say it's pronounced Job or Jop. Um, his book was called Pre-Colonial Black Africa. And he said that when you're writing about African civilizations, you don't make it a king's list. You don't start with this king and end with this king. You do it this way. You try and talk about depth. You talk about the politics. How was the society run? You talk about the economics. What products were people making? What money were they using? Did they have banks? Were they writing checks? These kinds of questions. You talk about the educational structures. Did they have schools? What proportion of people went to school? Universities, what were people studying? What were people researching? Uh, Male-female relationships, family structures. Who was rich? Who was in the middle? Who was poor? Um, the art, the architecture. These are the things that you need to talk about. And Professor Diop's model is the model that me and my colleagues used when we wrote everyday life in an early West African empire. What can we learn from the Songhai Empire? Well, the Songhai Empire has a very rich art heritage. 
a whole series of sculptures were found in an ancient West African city called Old Jenny. The sculptures are thought to have been made by women and they were made in female workshops. These sculptures show a mixture of naturalistic and abstract art and therefore it shows that people were thinking abstractly in terms of art heritage between 1000 and 1200 AD. Now that means more than 800 years ago, 700 years or more before Pablo Picasso and Modigliani. African scholars were thinking in a very modern, abstract, three-dimensional way and it shows up in the art. Then there's the architectural heritage. Some of the medieval West African cities still exist. Timbuktu still exists. Jene still exists. Walata still exists. Agade still exists. And many of these have their medieval uh, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th century houses. Many of them are two stories. And on the second story, they have indoor toilets. And the toilets then have plumbing that takes it, the waste from the second floor to well under the ground. And then what would happen is once people use the toilets, they would then pour hot water and pebbles down, which that mixture ends up, if you like, killing the um, offensive smells. Now, if you consider that if you were in medieval London and you went past someone's open window, you would have to duck. Whereas in these places, those cities, we have indoor toilets. There's also heritage in terms of government and government structure. Let me read you some of the West African governmental positions that used to exist in 16th century Songhai. We have Governor of Komina, Chief of the Summit, Superintendent over the Empire, Deputy in Charge of Floods, Director of the Port of Kabara, General Supervisor of the Palace, Royal Secretary, Chief of Etiquette and Protocol, Chief of Salaries, Chief of Purchasing, Chief of Punishment, Grio, Office of Engineers who was responsible for public works, Commissary of Police, Commissary of Police for Timbuktu, Generalissimo, Military Lieutenant, Military Person, Chief of Pirogs, Chief of the Flotilla, Master of the Cavalry. So we have government positions that sound very similar to what you would have in a modern civilization, including Chief of Etiquette and protocol. Then we have other areas too in the realm of economics. The Songhai Empire was a place that had banks. It was a place that had stock exchanges. It was a place where merchants were writing checks to other merchants. There's an account we have that survived written by a scholar called Ibn Halqal. He was writing in the year 951 AD and he visits one of the West African cities called Aldegast and witnesses a merchant writing another merchant a cheque for 42,000 golden dinars. So we've got banks, stock exchanges, exchange rates, cheques. The things that you'd expect in a modern commercial economy there were four types of currency. People were paid in gold, um, gold coins, cowrie shells, and in iron. And iron was sold as a uh, pound of iron, half a pound, a quarter. And the result then, with these types of currencies, you then have to have an exchange rate to connect the four different types of currencies. These kind of things uh, happened and a concern for controlling for price inflation. That appears in the documentation. That's why the royals like to keep control over the supply of gold. If gold was released too plentifully into the market, it would cause price inflation. There's other things too. Um, Richard Jobson, in his book, The Golden Trade, visits the Gambia region and remarked that the people of the region uh, ate once per day, believing that to eat once per day preserves their health. 
the Nation of Islam, their founder, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, has a very similar teaching about the link between eating once per day and preservation of health. Now, scientists in our times believe that if one eats what's called a calorie-restricted diet, um, calorie-restricted diets have been shown to improve the lifespan of animals. So if you, if you feed a rat um, two-thirds of the diet that a rat would ordinarily eat, it preserves the life. So the question has been raised, well, does that work with humans? And uh, about two years ago, I believe, the BBC did a documentary on something called the fast diet, also known as the 5-2 diet, where people eat naturally five days per week and fast two days per week. And that is really a modernized version of uh, what was being taught and practiced in the Songhai Empire when Richard Jobson was there. When it comes to the notion of family in the Songhai Empire, um, since Islam was a dominant religion, Islam is very male dominated. And when we read the accounts written by male historians about women, women are pretty much not in the picture. So that tells us that it was a very male dominated society. And the only authentic female perspective we have seems to be the physical art, which was largely done, if not entirely done, by women. Um, similarly, when it comes to things like school, um, according to the chronicle Mahmoud Kati's Tariq El Fatash, he uses the term schoolboys, schoolboys, schoolboys. He doesn't say both. In West Africa today, um, in Islamic schools, boys and girls study together. Now, it could well be that it's the translator's fault and it wasn't schoolboys, it was originally school children. We know that the city of Timbuktu in the 16th century had 165 Quran schools. And we know that one schoolmaster is known to have had 230 pupils. 230 pupils, 165 schools, that may mean a school population of about 39,000 people. Now I'm going to be conservative and let's just say 30,000 and done, but you can see how the mass was arrived at. Um, there are fatwas.